<laughs> of course. Um, I want to, you guys to clarify something about uh, the last uh, sacrifice um, amount, uh, the 14 billion. I heard a lot of facts about it, about uh, Perth being centralized and stuff like that, blah, blah, blah. So what do you think about it? Do you think that it's really Richard Hart that did it? And if yes, so what he, he may be aiming to? Because I don't think that he wants really to control everything. So do you think that he will aim to lock it and burn it? Or is it not really really related to him and it's another another part that actually sacrificed that just such an amount? If yes, why? And yeah, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, I guess comment on that is it, I think it's related to the OA address. I think we can see that on, on the chain. Um, in terms of it being FUD, I, I think that's exactly what it is. And if you can uh, weather the FUD and, and hold your pulse, then I think you'll be rewarded the way people that weathered the FUD of HEX were rewarded. Totally up to you. FUD will come and go. This, this FUD is kind of easy to see through, though. Hey, I, I've got a comment on that. Um, I, you know, for those that don't know me in the chat, it's like, I've been around since the beginning of hex and an OG, so to speak, and have weathered these kind of FUD attacks on hex from early on. And they continue still, but just not as loudly as they used to be or as frequent. Um, so with this, uh, you know, as far as your concern about the intent of whoever did that, um, it's been our experience in the hex community that the OA has been a benevolent, overlord of sorts um it's a rather long story but i mean i'm glad to go into it if someone wants more detail but the short version is basically um if you look at the origin of hex it there was an adoption amplifier where eth was put into the adoption amplifier and and basically that is how you uh claimed your hex every day uh, for the first 351 days of onboarding <clears throat> and during that period uh Obviously, the OA received a shit ton of Ethereum. Um, and before that, if we are assuming that Richard Hart is the OA, or at least a portion of a group of people that could be the OA is what I think, um, then my thinking would be, okay, this guy is already wealthy and retired, has a fuck ton of Bitcoin from his early mining days and being a Bitcoin maxi, um, and then flipped over to... Uh, supporting Ethereum. So I'm sure he acquired a bunch of Ethereum. And then the AA rolled along and he ended up with a ton of Ethereum. Um, and then during the AA process, he ended up with uh, a good portion of the hex supply. So if you look back, none of the ETH that ha was uh, deposited into the AA has ever been spent. It was distributed amongst uh, multiple wallets, which makes me think that's uh, either a security move or quite possibly payment to developers that were part of the original team. Uh, regardless, uh, none of that ETH, to my knowledge, has ever been spent. Um, then you look at the hex that was generated for the OA during that period of time. Um, also, that has never been spent, uh, all on-chain data. And then just prior to Big Payday is the only big move we ever saw with the OA, and they staked. And they did that on purpose. Um, there are a lot of people, including myself, you know, kind of licking their chops at the idea of getting a 300x or 300% return on any hex we were holding uh, when BPD came along. But at the same time, I felt like, you know, something, you know, this seems like it's ripe for abuse, uh, that some people could play this, uh, this pump, uh, buy in for the inevitable run up and then dump on our heads. So the OA stepped in and staked so we were effectively 98 percent staked i think going into bpd so it reduced those free tokens of the big payday bonus going into hands of those that would dump on our heads so after big payday we had a temporary dip down to 0 0.2 cents i believe and you can look on the chart it was rapidly bought up and it's been onward and upwards ever since then so all the behaviors of the OA have been um, supportive of the longevity of, and the and the uh, integrity of the product. Um, it doesn't make any sense for me to me that they would be doing anything that would be counter to these products succeeding. And I think it's a similar modality that's going on with the sacrifice 
of the OA and uh, to take uh, control of a larger portion of Pulse. Um, I think it's a matter of maybe being able to run some validator nodes themselves <clears throat> and also having the ability to um, limit the amount of fuckery that might go on uh, from what will surely be a highly speculative market. If there is more of it centralized in diamond hands and strong hands, I have no intent to sell, um, which, you know, from my previous points, it all, you know, it's like if you, if you had, if you were a multimillionaire before, you ended up with a giant bag of ETH before you ended up with a giant bag of hex before you ended up with a giant bag of pulse. It would be logical to assume that the very first thing that would be liquidated would be the ETH. So hex would be safe and then pulse would be safe. So that's my take on it. Um, hopefully that's not too long winded of, a, of an explanation and clear enough to address your concerns. If supply and demand matters, where's the supply? I'll tell you a story, a totally unrelated story. There's these rocks that you can dig out of the ground that are worth nothing. They're literally worth nothing. They're very, very common. You put them on drill bits, you put them on concrete saws, you put them on the tips of screwdrivers. If they're good German, wear a screwdrivers, W-E-R-A. Love those. Uh, well, actually... Some of their drill bits are diamond tip, but I think the wear screwdrivers I like are actually laser etched, a little different. Grips the thing that you're trying to turn better, a lot better. And what are these things called? They're called diamonds. Now, I'm wearing a lot of diamonds, a whole metric butt ton of them. Every one of these watches that you see with a diamond face, that adds 30 grand to the watch. So that's an extra 30 grand, that's an extra 30 grand. That's an extra 30 grand. Just the, just the dial, just the diamond dial. Covered in diamonds. The link is covered in diamonds. It's diamonds all over the place. Look at this. Rose gold, white gold, yellow gold, yellow diamond, blue diamond, white diamond. Did you know there were yellow and blue diamonds? Check it out and look. The rose goes with a rose, isn't that nice? Why am I telling you about this? Well, I started this statement by telling you that these things aren't worth anything. You can use them to coat your drill bits. So why are they so expensive? Ah, because the market has supply removed by people that prefer the price to be higher. In this case, the history of diamond prices is the De Beers Company out of South Africa. And the De Beers company owned 80% of all diamond mines, and I think still today, own 60%. Even after you have lab-created diamonds and, you know, new countries being formed and such. Yet diamonds are still really expensive. And they've been around for hundreds of years. Probably thousands, but we'll just call it hundreds. Wow. Wow. So a diamond in the rough is when you find something good in a patch of stuff that sucks. Diamond hands is when you hold something so tight that the compression turns your hand into a diamond. How did they do that? How did they turn common, valueless, sparkly carbon, which by the way, lab created is superior to, why is it so expensive? Because they buy it all up. They restrict the supply. They reduce the supply. They put out advertisements. Diamonds are a girl's best friend. There was a time before that advertisement when diamonds were not a girl's best friend. And diamonds were not what you bought people for a wedding gift. But due to good marketing and good advertising and decades of value storage, people figured out that these things would be more likely to go up than down. Now, who else has done this? Diamonds did that, and it's lasted for hundreds of years. Louis Vuitton did it, 